The oldest depiction of Jesus known to humankind is not a flattering one. Instead, it's graffiti depicting Jesus crucified and having the head of a donkey. It was made, though crudely, by enemies of Christianity. But it's kind of one of those deals where it all boomerangs, it all backfires, because in an attempt to mock God and mock Jesus, what <laughs> these vandals accidentally did is they created a record indicating a few really useful details about what people knew and believed about Jesus of Nazareth in the Roman Empire somewhere between the late 1st century and early 3rd century AD. It's like Yankee Doodle. Yankee Doodle's a patriotic song in my country, but it was a song that was meant to make fun of Americans during the revolution. But sometimes you kind of wear the insults, right? And the insult actually becomes flattery. And the fact that somebody else has even taken the time to make fun of you or your thing maybe it means you sort of arrived a little bit. I think this is one of those situations. So what I want to do in this little video is first I want to talk about what this very ancient piece of art, if we can call it that, is, where it was found, how it happened, how it was rediscovered, all that kind of stuff. Then I want to talk about why a donkey head? Where did that come from? I think what we're going to find as we talk about that is that this depiction is not just a childish, churlish silly insult, like, aha, you're an ass. I mean, it, it's that a little bit, but it's derived from a tradition that existed for centuries before this, a tradition of mockery that wasn't just directed at Christians, it was directed at Jews as well. More on that in a minute. So we're going to talk about what it is. We're going to talk about why it is. And then I want to talk about why it matters. What does this mean? Why is it important? I guess I touched on a couple of those things already. But this very ancient work of art is known as the Alexamenos Graffito. Graffito, like the singular of graffiti. And it was discovered in 1857 on the Palatine Hill in Rome. The Palatine Hill is one of the seven hills of Rome. If you go to visit Rome now, the most likely place that you're going to go in terms of visiting archaeological sites is going to be the Colosseum and the Forum. Those are the famous ones. They're adjoining, and the Forum sits in this long valley. There's centuries of history stacked on top of each other there. And if you go up the hill from there uh, toward Circus Maximus, the great big Ben-Hur chariot racetrack, up on top of there is where all of the palaces and gardens of the emperors were for from yeah, the time of Jesus for centuries to come. And in the 1850s, a building got excavated there called a pedagogium. And this is where the Alexamenos Graffito or Alexamenos, I'm not totally sure how to pronounce it. Nobody seems to agree on it. That is where this thing was found. But that begs the question, what's a pedagogium? I think the leading theory on this is that maybe promising young slaves were boarded here and went to school all day and were tutored in different things that would be useful as they served in a noble household. Maybe even someday they'd take that knowledge and buy their own freedom and start their own household. That happened sometimes in Rome. But the other thing that happened sometimes in Rome and that has happened probably everywhere since is that boys got bored in class. And when the teacher turned around, they made fun of each other and they drew crude pictures depicting things that would be useful for mocking other people and probably dirty stuff because they're boys and that's what happens. So this Alexamenos Graffito is bullying. I mean, maybe it's playful bullying. Maybe it's very mean. You can make of it what you will. But this is meant to mock a classmate. Who is the classmate? Well, Alexamenos is the butt of the joke here along with Jesus of Nazareth and all Christians. And so what you got is a caption that says, Alexamenos worships his God. And then Alexamenos is depicted. He's a young man. He's got a nice full head of hair. And he is in a position of Roman worship, I guess. Maybe it's just not a good drawing, and that's not how Romans looked when they worshiped someone. Or maybe it's an excellent drawing, and it was meant to be reminiscent of the pose struck by a Roman augur. Or maybe it's meant to look like these little household deities that apparently everybody in Rome had called Lares. Maybe Alexamenos or Alexamenos or Alexamenos is meant to look like one of these little fellas. Who knows? But then above that is somebody who's getting crucified. 
It's a humanoid body, but it's got the head of a donkey or an ass. And the cross, you will note, is not shaped in the same way that Christians depict crosses. We depict that as a lowercase t in Christian art for all of time. But here it's depicted as an uppercase t. So there's no top part to the bar, which I guess is fortuitous if you're really trying to make fun of Alexa Menos because it gets that top part of the bar out of the way so you can better show that uh, Jesus has a donkey head. He has a head of an ass. Get it? We're making fun of you. A couple interesting things of note about this depiction of a crucifixion is that it's shown from the backside and the person being crucified is naked. There's no loincloth as more dignified depictions of Jesus through the centuries have. There's no indication in the Bible that Jesus had anything on when he got crucified. If anything, it says the soldiers had his clothes. So it's possible that Jesus was up there completely naked. Because remember, the point of a crucifixion, as opposed to, say, a more dignified death like a beheading, was to make an example out of the person being crucified. That's why it was reserved for traitors and insurrectionists. The idea was, don't be like this guy. If you do what he did, this is what's going to happen to you. So Jesus in the Alexa Menos Graffito is depicted as being naked. He's shown from behind, and he has the very obvious head of an ass. And may I just salute whoever this blonde-haired, thick-necked, fresh 80s bully. May I just salute this person because they did a really good job with that donkey head. It looks very, very donkey-ish. Oh, and the other thing of note, Jesus is depicted as having his feet not stacked on top of each other, as is so often the depiction, but his feet are separated at you know shoulder width. And this is consistent with other ancient depictions or depictions of crucifixions from this era in Rome. There are two other ones that show it the same way. But we do know that nails through the feet were a thing, whether that went through both feet or just one foot to keep them up there so people wouldn't take someone crucified off the cross prematurely and try to save them. We don't know if it was you know, one nail per foot or two, but we do know they did it because we literally have some dude's foot from Jerusalem who was crucified by the Romans and there's a nail going right through his foot. I mean, smoking gun evidence that this is how this worked. But these other two depictions of... A crucifixion that we get from roughly the same time period or from just down the road from Rome at the port city of Puteoli, the Apostle Paul stopped by there. The depictions, one is an amulet, sorry, and the other is a graffito, much like this. Both of them have that wide stance crucifixion. Both of them are shown from behind. Both of them depict someone who's fully naked. These other two depictions is no donkey head. It's, you know, looks like a dude, but they both depict flogging or maybe even flaying, like cutting open the crucified person. And I mean, it's, it's really pretty graphic. Of the three, this is the tamest in terms of depiction of bodily harm. Now, if you go to Rome right now, you can see the building. The pedagogium is still there. And I think there, yeah, there's a little sign that shows that this is where this piece of art was extracted from the wall. If you actually want to see it, it's inside the Palatine Museum, which costs extra money. Come on, it's like 18 extra bucks to get in there now. And it used to be displayed way out of the way. You couldn't see it clearly at all, but now it's down and it's it's very prominently displayed in a well-lit spot. You can get a really good look at the first depiction of Jesus ever. The other thing that I think is interesting, though, is that this isn't the only graffiti or graffito in the pedagogium. Again, this is the boys' boarding school. There's going to be tons of it. A couple rooms over, there's another etching in the wall that says Alexa Menos is faithful. Hmm, that's interesting. Maybe he had a buddy or somebody else who was on his side. Or maybe Alexa Menos was in there laying awake at night in his own room because nobody wanted to be his roommate because he's getting made fun of for being a Christian. And he etched that about himself as he had damp eyes as a boy going through the turmoil of the middle school environment and being tortured and humiliated by uh, his rivals and bullies. Maybe he's over there saying like, oh, well, you know, you make fun of me all you want, but I'm faithful and this is what I believe. I'm going to stick to it. I think that's pretty cool. Additionally, though, there is more art in this very same building 
that depicts donkeys. Now, in this case, it's not a donkey crucifixion, but rather it's a depiction of a donkey. I have to read the quote. I've got it over here. Uh, slaving away. And the translation on this depiction is, work little donkey as I worked and it will be useful to you. And apparently this is a slave boy in school, doesn't like his teacher, getting badgered and forced to do a bunch of stuff so that he can be better prepared for a lifetime of servitude. I think it's a valid thing to complain about and draw pictures of and make fun of. But it also indicates that I mean, there's some kind of thing with donkeys going on here. Asses. I mean, that's just a funny word anyway. I, something about this concept is very um, fertile for the joking and jabbing ideas of young men. I wonder if there's another layer of meaning to what we're seeing here with this. If this isn't just a one-off mockery where the boys are like, ha Jesus is a donkey. Alexamenos is an idiot. But I wonder if there's some memeing going on here where there was a whole donkey joke thing running through these whole barracks and one joke piled upon the next joke and piled upon the next joke. I mean, think about memes you've seen on the internet and now imagine you don't know where they came from or how they worked. You would never understand the fourth or fifth or sixth level of meaning to that joke. And so I kind of wonder what level of donkey joke this one was amongst the boys who were bored and had nothing better to do than make fun of each other and crack juvenile jokes with each other. My point is, I don't think this happened in a vacuum. And the people who have studied this historically did not think in terms of memeology and meme humor. And now we look at this through the lenses of the 21st century and kind of makes you wonder. But that leads me to another point. The first objective of our conversation here was to work through what this thing is. I think we've more or less done that. The second objective was to think through why the donkey head? That feels oddly mean and specific and personal. And I guess I just gave you one theory, which is the meme juvenile humor theory. But there's another reason that I think the donkey head is on Jesus here. And that's not as much of a theory. This is pretty well documented. There was this association in the ancient world between donkey worship. I wrote down the name of that donkey worship, onolatry. I didn't know that was the term. People who worshiped a donkey were called asenari or asenari, people who, for whatever reason, worship a donkey. And the Jews were accused of being asenari for yeah, I don't know, 300, 350 years before the time of Jesus. This started apparently in Egypt. Now, Alexander the Great in the late 300s BC, this guy right here, I've got his coin, that's kind of fun. He went and defeated Persia and shook up the world. And in the process of that, a whole bunch of Jews who had been living under Persian rule moved to Alexandria in Egypt, named for Alexander the Great, the conqueror. And there they decided to translate their scriptures from the largely unknown tongue of Hebrew that their neighbors couldn't read into the lingua franca of the day, which was Greek. Well, now everybody could read the Hebrew scriptures. And I think a lot of the Egyptians didn't like what they found there because Exodus isn't the kind of book that's going to make you feel good if you're an Egyptian living in 200 or 300 BC. And so they started to associate Yahweh, the creator God, you know, I am the God of the Bible, with the evil Egyptian donkey-headed god, Set or Seth. This is not a very flattering association. So they're saying the Jews are Asinari, who worship a donkey. And Josephus, who wrote in the first century AD, says that accusations have been flying around that they even had like the gold head of a donkey in their temple and that they were worshiping this. And this accusation was leveled, according to Josephus, by an Egyptian dude. It goes like this. For Apion, that's the Egyptian dude, hath the impudence to pretend that, quote, the Jews placed an ass's head in their holy place, unquote. And he affirms that this was discovered when Antiochus Epiphanes, he's a Greek ruler, spoiled our temple and found that ass's head there made of gold and worth a great deal of money. And Josephus goes on to be like, that didn't happen, that never happened, but even if it did, like you all worship all kinds of 
people, body, and animal head combinations. Why are you making fun of this one while you all hung up on it? What's your real problem? But you can sort of see there the combination of a few of the really ancient stories of the Bible that outsiders may be latched on to, including the golden calf and maybe Balaam and his donkey from Numbers 22, where the donkey starts talking to Balaam and tells Balaam to pronounce blessings, not curses, on the Israelite, the Hebrew people. You know, maybe they kind of mushed that stuff together along with wanting the Jews to worship their bad guy deity, and that's how it happened. Well, fast forward a ways, and this has been circulated by really prominent people like Plutarch and Tacitus. These are secular Roman historians. And at some point, the Jews catch a break because the accusation of ass worship goes away from being targeted at the Jews and being targeted at the Christians instead. And indeed, Tertullian, one of the church fathers who was he was writing in the late 100s AD into the early 200s, he gives an account of somebody coming to town and straight up mocking Jesus by putting together somewhere in the late 100s AD a whole like donkey Jesus cosplay outfit that he marched around through downtown Alexandria, like making a, a whole fool of himself. Um, and Tertullian, to his credit, thought it was pretty funny and just laughed at it. But this is the quote from Tertullian's Apology, chapter 16. But lately, a new edition of our God has been given to the world in that great city. It originated with a certain vile man who was wont to hire himself out to cheat the wild beasts and who exhibited a picture with this inscription, quote, the God of the Christians, born of an ass. He had the ears of an ass, was hoofed in one foot, carried a book and wore a toga. Both the name and the figure gave us amusement but our opponents ought straight away to have done homage to this biformed divinity, for they've acknowledged God's dog-headed and lion-headed with horn or buck and ram, with goat-like loins, with serpent legs, with wings sprouting from back or foot. And he goes on to say, we've talked about this at length. It's an old joke. Ha ha ha. We worship the God of a donkey. You guys are being ridiculous. But he's really, he's making the same reasoning. Tertullian, who's a Christian, is appealing to the same reasoning that Josephus, who is a secular-ish Jew, was appealing to a hundred years earlier. He's like, what's the hang-up on this idea? Even if it were true, and it's not, like you all worship every animal under the sun. You make goofy outfits and like okie dokie. So I love that his point is like, I don't understand why the people who were laughing at us over this didn't just immediately fall on their faces and worship it because that's what you do. So apparently it was a whole thing. That's the point. And this doesn't really help us nail down the exact date of the graffito because mockery of Jews and Christians for worshiping an ass had existed for hundreds of years before the time of Jesus and, well, then mocking Christians from basically the time of Jesus on into who knows when, I guess, in a lot of ways, if you cruise around the internet right now, there are still people who probably make fun of Christians for worshiping what they imagine to be an ass. So I guess the final thing that I want to talk about here is what do we do with it? What does it mean? What do you make of this? And I suppose one of the most delightful points of all of this, I mean, from my perspective, is somebody who worships that God who is being crudely depicted in that work of art. One of the sweetest things for me is what you intended for evil, God intended for good, or what you intended as a mockery, we wear like a badge of honor. Uh, yeah, the whole joke of the crucifixion is that the forces of evil thought they won, that they really believed that would do it. They really believed that they could just kill with some nails and stabbing someone who had power over the weather and life and death and did all of these manifestations of power over all of nature in front of everybody, friend and foe alike. And you thought you could just stab him and that would work and that he would stay dead. But rather it is in the very humiliation and defense of the cross that Christians believe that death and sin is defeated, that the 
kingdom is announced and initiated, that people's sin and failure and the human problem are dealt with and resolved and that a way to God is made. So what is depicted here as an ass on a cross and an absurd thing to worship, why would you worship something that got crucified and lost, you fools? Well, that's not supposed to make sense to the world. It's supposed to be baffling until God opens somebody's eyes to see what this is. The power of the world since the dawn of time has been used to try to defeat death, cheat death, solve the human problem, and even our noblest attempts have failed. Yet in the humiliation and the offense of the cross, the humbling of Jesus taking on the very nature of a servant, even to the point of death, is key to Christian thought. So these are outsiders making fun of the thing, thinking they're really, really owning poor Alexa Manos. But I wonder if Alexa Manos was rooted enough in his faith and in the scriptures to realize <laughs> like, what you guys are making fun of is totally a feature, not a bug of this thing. So I think it's super interesting the way the whole thing kind of boomerangs around and the intended purpose doesn't work out for the bullies and the critics here. I don't think it's, I also, I think it's super interesting that the oldest depiction of Christianity isn't flattering or of Christ isn't flattering. It's from enemies. It's from people who look at that and feel a need to make fun of it and feel a need to do something about it. There is something about Jesus and the Bible and the church and his life and his teachings and his actions and his death and his resurrection and his never really leading an open rebellion nor never really bending the knee to government as savior. There's something about that that's really provocative. And even people who never ultimately come around to believing anything meaningful about Jesus, everybody for 2,000 years has felt this impulse, this internal need to reckon with that story because it's not like other stories. The claims of it are provocative. It demands that you think about it and attempts to hand wave it or mock it aren't very effective. Everybody ends up thinking about Jesus at some point and folks land where they land. Jesus and Christianity, this whole thing was making such major waves that this was something that was worth making fun of. And that really does tell a historical story that I think is pretty powerful. Finally, there's one verse if you've read the Bible a lot, you probably knew that I was going to end up reading this verse at the end. It's Galatians 6, 7. Some of you were like, mm, I knew it. I was saying that right then. This is, um, if you don't know it off the top of your head, that's fine. But it, it kind of sums up how I feel about this whole thing. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. If God actually is God, if Jesus actually is the son of God and God in the flesh, even if you try to make fun of him, you can't. Not all religions are like that. Some get very, very angry if you depict their sacred things in ways that they don't like or depict them at all. Not the case with Christianity. Why? Because I think this is true. You read the whole Bible and this isn't just a little one-off verse. This is a summary of kind of what the whole thing says. If we're talking about the one actual true creator deity who's the maker and sustainer of all things and the savior of the world, then you can say whatever you want. You can't actually successfully mock that God. Any mockery would just be turned around by the sheer nature of the force and the truth of the reality of who that God is. And I think the fact that the earliest depiction we have of Jesus of Nazareth and his crucifixion is an attempt at mockery is sort of testament to that. This is fun. Thank you for being willing to dive into this. I, I mean, how wild would it be to be those boys and time travel and pull up a YouTube video and see all the stuff that's been written about this and be like, are you serious? I was just screwing around. I was just like in your butt. Like I was just trying to make fun of somebody a little bit. And it's like this gigantic thing that a gajillion people have studied and talked about over the centuries. Yep. Jokes on you, schoolyard bullies. Got you on that one. All right. This is fun. Um, there's a new YouTube channel. It's, it's called the 10 minute Bible hour podcast. Now I've been doing this podcast for ever many, many years now. We just pick a book of the Bible. We go straight through it one day at a time. It's roughly 10 ish minutes of content with a little bit of joking around on the front and the back end. 
That's available anywhere you get a podcast. As I'm recording this, we're just about to start a new season on the book of Galatians. You can get that now on YouTube and through, I guess I call it YouTube music. Just go search the 10 Minute Bible Hour podcast. That should come up. I'll also link it below and in the description of this channel so you can go and find it if you want to. If not, that's cool. No sweat. If you do go find it, by the way, a subscription would be really helpful over there to help get that off the ground and established over here on the YouTube side. There, that's everything I wanted to say. Thanks for talking about the Alexa Menos Graffito, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts on it down in the comment section below. All right, I'm Matt. Thanks for hanging out with me on my YouTube channel. Let's do this again soon.